Yes, you read the title to this video correctly. I took a Linux-powered machine to a LAN party. And I didn't even need the scotch. In a time where games are growing too large to install, one gamer will quest to download them all. What do you need? Storage. Lots of storage. This fall, games will load faster. You'll discover power can be held in the smallest of things. And your PC will never be the same again. Rat! Rat! We happy? We happy. The NM800 Pro NVMe drive from Lexar will transform your PC into an action-packed adrenaline rush. With PCI Express Gen 4x4 and speeds of up to 7,500 megabytes per second. Get the storage and the speed you're after with the NM800 Pro NVMe SSD from Lexar by following the link down in the video description. Ooh, welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Ah, uh, the LAN party. You know those events we used to go to, where you'd pack the most expensive PCs and peripherals you own haphazardly into the back of a car, travel hours from your house just to awkwardly socialize with people you ordinarily only talk to over a gaming headset. That time stands still feeling of, is the sun going down or is it on its way back up? While the phrase, just one more round, lives rent free inside your mind. You know, LAN parties, where you'll pay $150 for a seat at a table, and no matter how meticulous you're planning and prep beforehand, you'll either spring a leak in your water-cooled system, drop a monitor, or have an OS update stop you dead in your tracks. So why then, given all the potential issues and headache that could have brought my weekend to a screeching halt, did I choose to bring a system that runs Linux instead of Windows? The fact of the matter is, I felt so strongly about Linux being a suitable gaming platform, I decided to go all out and skip Windows entirely at PDX LAN this last weekend. And if you're looking for a 20 second synopsis of this video, that's pretty much it right there. Gaming on Linux just kind of worked. My choice in PC was this beast of an ITX machine that I call Heavy Metal. It's a 100% custom chassis made out of 3 8 inch steel plate and uses copper tubing for the water lines. Inside is an ROG Strix Z690i motherboard and an Intel i9-12900K. Keeping things cool and quiet are an AlphaCool Ice Bar pump reservoir and block combo, a 280mm Corsair radiator, and a pair of Be Quiet Lightwing fans. We've also got 32 gigabytes of Corsair 5200MTS DDR5, a 2 terabyte Corsair Gen 4x4 NVMe SSD, an EVGA 850 watt SFX power supply with custom cable mod cables, and just for good measure, an AMD Radeon RX 6900XT graphics card with 16 gigabytes of GDDR6. If you wanna see how this PC came together, I'll have the pair of build videos down in the video description. Needless to say, there are some gratuitous scenes of full PC nudity. Viewer discretion is advised. While I initially installed Windows on this PC, that only lasted for its first month or so, as I did my initial review of SteamOS 3.0 on this exact machine. To say that review has been popular on this channel would be quite the understatement, as it's easily the most watched video that I've produced this year. Obviously, there is a ton of interest around finding an alternative for Windows when it comes to gaming. So I figured with PDX LAN Fall 2022 coming up, I'd figuratively put my money where my mouth is and travel with nothing but a Linux gaming rig for three days of gaming bliss. Now, before we get much further into this video, I should preface the next bit by stating I don't play most of the common competitive titles. Overwatch, Fortnite, CSGO, ranked first person shooter matches just aren't my jam at this point in my life. So I'm not going to be a great point of authority when it comes to those titles. I understand some games now have somewhat official support from anti-cheat providers for running on Linux, but that is far from a guarantee when you're in ranked games. I'd also go so far to say as I don't think anti-cheat or OS limitations are a bad thing when it comes to competitive multiplayer. Most organized sports have rules and regulations around allowed equipment, and I don't think Overwatch requiring Windows is a bad move to keep a level playing field for all. That's just something to keep in mind when you're deciding on which operating system you want to run inside of your gaming rig. 
So what games did I play at PDX Land this year? Well, Rhett and I dusted off our Rocket League shoes, and while we missed the entry into the tournament at the LAN, we did play enough rounds to get ranked in doubles play, so I'll take that as a win. Now I know I spent almost 45 seconds saying that I don't like to play a lot of online competitive games, followed immediately by me jumping into ranked Rocket League matchups, and I certainly didn't expect to be playing Rocket League for four hours of my time there either. Which again, just kind of goes to show how confident I am in Linux as a gaming platform at this point. Does your friend want to randomly jump into ranked games against PCs, PlayStation, and Nintendo Switch gamers? Great! Install the game onto your Linux desktop and get going! And just for clarification, this is the 100% up-to-date Windows version of Rocket League running in Steam through Proton, not the horribly out-of-date Linux game client that Psyonix killed a couple years ago and is no longer able to play online. Friday night, I dived into Risk of Rain 2 for another four hours. This is a game I'd never played before and installed right there at the LAN. There was absolutely no drama with it either, as it installed and ran just like a normal Steam game would on Windows, only I'm on Pop! OS. If you've never played this game before, it's a four-player co-op where you fight waves of enemies while collecting items and buffs for your characters and your crew. Think of it like Borderlands, but with no story, mixing in a little Dark Souls and some permadeath. You fight to survive, and if a single player defeats the boss and activates the teleporter, you all advance to the next round, complete with all the gear that you've gathered to that point. But death of your crew results in permadeath, and you only get to carry your experience back to the main menu. Your experience points do unlock new playable characters and a very small number of upgrades, but none of the buffs or items you unlock in levels are saved. It's a very addicting experience, whether you're going at it in single player or with a four player team. This game also had absolutely no trouble playing on this beast of a PC, as even pushing an ultra-wide 3440x1440 display at 144Hz didn't even require the fan to kick on on the 6900XT. And it's not like Rocket League requires a ton of horsepower either. So why don't we talk about games that actually made heavy metal sweat? On Saturday morning, I discovered that Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, a Dungeons & Dragons style spin-off of the Borderlands series, was half-priced on Steam. Naturally, I picked it up and installed all 50 gigabytes of it thanks to Comcast's 10 gig symmetrical connection provided to PDX LAN. Apparently, Comcast has no trouble spinning up temporary fiber lines for events, but I have to pay $50 extra to even get 50 megabit upload on a business line with no options to go higher despite a DOCSIS 3.1 modem supporting well over 500 megabit upload speeds. Oh well. The latest in the Shooter Looter series ran absolutely perfectly with no configuration or elbow grease required. It pushed my ultra-wide 1440p monitor at 100 frames per second on average, all at 100% maxed out settings, and with lows that didn't even register to my eye. Of course, one of the coolest things that I discovered while playing this game was that AMD's FSR 2.0 was natively supported in this title, and actually turned on and worked. No longer did I have to suffer with a measly 100 frames per second. Machine learning was able to lower the rendered resolution and upsample textures in real time, driving my display at a nearly perfect 144 FPS. To be clear, the performance without FSR was impressive to say the least, but just like in Windows, having FSR available and in-game that requires split-second reaction times and precise aiming made that experience that much better. And having it work out of the box in a non-native OS is still mind-blowing to me, even a week later. Of course, even if your games run without issue, there's still the whole problem of sometimes needing your gaming rig to work as a PC. I'm an avid college football fan, and my stupid sleep-deprived monkey brain left my laptop in the hotel room on Saturday, leaving me with only a single monitor to both play games and to stream football games on. And yet again, Pop! OS had no problems at all doing this. Games ran in windowed mode just fine, and it even allowed other applications like Firefox to sit on top. Through the afternoon, I played a half dozen other games, some windowed, some full screen, all while alt-tabbing between the game and a sports stream, and never once did I have a stutter or a lockup. When it comes to personal preferences, we like to put people into boxes. You're either a Windows guy or you're a Mac guy. You're a Ford lover or a Chevy fanboy, Canon or Nikon. But I've always found that picking one camp or the other to be far too limiting if you're an enthusiast. Although I use Linux, I'm not a Linux guy. 
In fact, right now in my office, there are three Windows PCs, two Linux PCs, three Macs, an Android phone, and an iPad. And I jump between them on the fly, depending on what I'm working on. The fact that Linux now just works as a gaming PC means there's more choice than ever on what you want to run for an operating system. And I'm not gonna sit here and say that this is absolutely perfect yet and you should format your Windows PC and install Linux. I'm also not gonna sit here and wax poetic about how great Windows or Mac OS are either. They're all just tools, each with their own sets of pros and cons. But even if 2023 isn't the year of the Linux desktop, just like the last 30 years that came before it, at least we have another viable option. And for that, we should all be excited. As always, if you're interested in any of the parts from this build, I will have affiliate links down in the video description. Go give those a look. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on... Well, I guess you really can't do that anymore. If you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Beer for today is from Paperback Brewing. It is Bunny with a Chainsaw. His cuteness will cut you to pieces. Double dry hopped, hazy IPA, clocking in at 8.2%. All right, so Paperback's Bunny with a Chainsaw. Aromatics are even themselves very, very dry in this one. It's kind of like trying to get aroma off of a red wine. Like it's there, but it doesn't want to give up all of its notes and all of its secrets. And you know it's probably holding something back. When it comes to flavor on this one, it's again, very dry. Uh, which is surprising for the direction that most hazies have been going. They've been trying to go more towards the, like, orange juice and tang and sunny D and those, you know, super citrusy yet super juicy uh, type drinks. This one is kind of leaning a little bit more towards uh, the alchemist, you know, towards the uh, uh, heady topper uh, style of hazy. And honestly, it's quite delicious. Uh, this definitely has some citrus notes kind of right up front, but they fade very quickly in favor of some slightly richer type flavors. Um, when I say richer, I'm gonna give you some examples, but do note that's not exactly what I'm trying to say it tastes like. I'm saying it's shades of this. Think of like strawberry rhubarb or fig or kiwi or something like that. Um, but with like a melon flavor to it. I know it sounds crazy. I, I know what I'm saying right now sounds a little crazy. That's why I waited so long into the video to do this beer review is I wanted to suss out exactly what I wanted to say first. It's an interesting beer. It's a very interesting beer. Is this going to be for everyone? No. Is it very complex? Yes. Is complexity great? Depends on who you ask.